This video was brought to you by our podcast, Trust Issues. Last week, Russian President Vladimir Putin issued fresh threats to the West. He claimed that the US and the West are engaging in nuclear blackmail, and went on to say that, in its aggressive anti-Russian policy, the West has crossed every line. This is not a bluff. And those who try to blackmail us with nuclear weapons should know that the weather vane can turn and point towards them. Unfortunately, it's clear that Putin is engaging in nuclear sabre-rattling. He hopes the West will view his comments as increasing the risk of direct confrontation between the East and the West. This threat of World War III, he hopes, will increase the likelihood of the West dropping or watering down their support for Ukraine. So it's worth evaluating the game theory of the situation, and the three options the West has if Putin does reach for the nuclear button. Before we get into the options, we need to first understand why Putin may go nuclear in the first place. It's fair to say that Putin's war in Ukraine isn't going well. His forces are being pushed back further and further in the east and south of Ukraine, and it's becoming obvious that he's getting desperate. He's already ordered a partial mobilisation, and we can expect these extra troops to arrive on the battlefield in the next few months. The question is, though, will they be enough to turn the tide of the war in his favour? And what will he do if they don't? Well, the thing about Putin is that he's not really democratically elected. He's an autocrat, and as such, he doesn't really have any easy way to leave office gracefully. If he can't turn the war around, a coup against him becomes more likely. And putting aside any risk he would personally be under if this were to happen, it would also be hugely humiliating and would damage his legacy. And if his partial mobilisation does fail to make any progress in Ukraine for Russia, Putin will begin contemplating some more extreme solutions to his Ukraine problem. Potentially tactical nuclear weapons. As we mentioned at the start, he's already been threatening their use explicitly. It makes sense, then, for politicians and military experts in the West to come up with some plans of what to do if Putin does decide to launch a nuke. So let's give them a hand and run through their different options and the best and worst case scenarios of each. Luckily for us, Matthew Kronig at the Atlantic Council has provided three possible responses and their respective pros and cons. Now, we've come up with a flowchart for them, with each right branch representing an escalation from the US and each left branch representing a de-escalation. In previous game theory videos that we've released, we've assigned a utility function to each potential action on the flowchart. Now, while we'd love to do the same here, the situation is so fluid and it's just impossible to get at how good each action could be for both the US and the West and Russia. So instead, we'll explain the possible pros and cons of each action. The first potential response to the use of a tactical nuke is to scale up sanctions against Russia while providing more arms to Ukraine. This is essentially a de-escalation, although it would, in essence, isolate Russia even further from the rest of the world, further establishing them as a pariah state. One advantage to this strategy is that it could win over some states that so far have been reluctant to move with the West to implement sanctions on Russia, such as India and potentially even China. In addition to this though, Kronig argues that it would be worthwhile for the US to go on nuclear alert. While this wouldn't involve the US actually launching any nukes, it would provide a deterrent effect against Russia, just in case they got any ideas of committing a similar attack on any NATO allies. Now, the advantages of such a plan are fairly obvious. Russia would be punished by being further isolated from the world. As they're already struggling because of this, it could be enough to prevent them from using a tactical nuke again or escalating even further. The disadvantages are also clear though, namely that there's a risk that this just isn't enough of a deterrent and other nuclear states could begin to get ideas about deploying their own nukes safe in the knowledge that they won't be attacked back. In all honesty then, a plan that risks further nuclear escalation by other foes probably isn't the one to go for, so let's have a look at another potential response. We'll start by going down the escalation side of the graph. The next step up is the use of conventional warfare. 
In essence, the US and the West could conduct a strike against Russian bases that were involved in the nuclear attack. The US could even scale up their response and officially enter the war on Ukraine's side. Now, this has the benefit of providing a robust response to Russia, demonstrating the nuclear attacks will not go unpunished. This could thus reinforce the nuclear taboo, even in the event of smaller nuclear weapons. The main downside of this, though, would be, and there's no easy way of saying this, the very real possibility of World War III. Obviously, conflict between the US and the West and Russia could very easily spiral into something much worse. Even if the worst case scenario of this response didn't happen, there's also the possibility that other nuclear states still don't view this as enough of a deterrent. Russia themselves could conclude that the US is unwilling to use nuclear weapons and be emboldened to use them in future conflicts. This brings us on to, then, the final option. The US uses a nuclear weapon against Russia. This is obviously the largest escalation, and comes with the largest risk. It goes without saying that this option is far from ideal either. Its only upside is that it could deter future use of nuclear attacks, certainly more so than the other options. The main downside, though, is, well, full-scale nuclear apocalypse. Having reviewed the three options, Kronig argues that a mix between the first and second option would be the best. So, in essence, increasing sanctions and also attacking the Russian base that launched the attack. Now, it should be made clear here that it is by no means certain, or even particularly likely, that Putin will resort to the use of tactical nuclear weapons. In fact, in the very same article, Kronig presents different options which could prevent Putin from reaching for the nuclear button in the first place. Basically, weighing up the pros and cons of using specific versus vague threats. Specific threats have the advantage of being a greater deterrent, whereas vague threats give the West more license to judge situations as and when they happen. Writing for Bloomberg, Andreas Kluth goes further, arguing that while vague public threats would be good, being specific behind closed doors with Putin could be the best strategy for preventing Putin from using nuclear weapons in the first place. If world leaders from Biden to Xi should make clear to Putin privately that if he uses nukes, they would forcibly remove him and his administration from power. This goes back to what we mentioned at the start, that the reason Putin may go nuclear in the first place is that he fears that he may lose power. If leaders made clear to him that if he does go nuclear, he will definitely lose power, this may ultimately change the risk-reward dynamic for him and prevent such destructive weapons being used. Anyway, irrespective of the prospects of possible nuclear war in the next few months, this winter is definitely looking rough for both the US and Russia, but also countries all around the world. Here in the UK, it's been suggested that there could be blackouts in November and December, which is something we actually discuss on our podcast, Truss Issues. This is the podcast where we're evaluating Liz Truss's first 100 days in office and working out if she will even make it to 100. Since we promoted it earlier in the week, the show jumped 93 places on the podcast charts to become the UK's 23rd biggest political podcast. In fact, in the last couple of days, it's now got to number 10. We can do better though, so subscribe in your favourite podcast app for more political chatter, or you can watch it on the TLDR podcast YouTube channel.